Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville. This is the Final Straw Radio. This is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. Belarus is continuing to experience a revolt against the 26 year dictatorship of post Soviet dictator Alexander Lukashenko. The situation came to a boil, fueled by yet another election rife with administrative corruption, the creation of mutual aid infrastructure in the face of a government that abandoned public health measures amidst the coronavirus pandemic, decreased economic quality of life. People found each other and the state turned on them. In response to police violence, regular folks came out into the streets to oppose the dictatorship and the system threatened collapse. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? For the hour, we speak with Ivan, a Belarusian anarchist living in Germany, about the uprising, doxing cops, the part that anarchists have played, the distinction between pro-democracy and anti-dictatorship activity, the upcoming week of solidarity with anarchists and anti-fascists from Belarus from November 23rd to the 30th of 2020, and how comrades from abroad can support not only those repressed, but the activist efforts to sustain the resistance to the Belarusian dictatorship. You can learn more about the Week of Solidarity, including where to send funds and communiques at abc-belarus.org. You can also support wider protest infrastructure by donating at firefund.net slash Belarus. A great news source that Ivan mentions to keep up on anarchist perspectives from Belarus, sometimes in English, is pramen.io forward slash en forward slash main. And now a couple of political prisoner updates. Black Liberation fighter Russell Maroon Schultz has tested positive for COVID-19. Maroon, a former member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, is a political prisoner and prisoner of war held by the state of Pennsylvania. Maroon has been in prison since 1972, when he was given a life sentence for an attack on a police station. He was held in solitary confinement from 1991 to 2014, when he was allowed to return to Gen Pop. Maroon is already being treated for stage 4 cancer and is forced to live in inhumane prison conditions. Given his positive COVID-19 diagnosis and his already compromised health, we demand his immediate release and the release of all elderly prisoners. From a Facebook post on the page of Russell Schultz III, Maroon, quote, is a political prisoner enslaved for his efforts to liberate our people. He's the father of my dear friend Russell Schultz III. In addition to COVID-19, Maroon is also suffering from stage 4 colon cancer. He is living in tremendous pain in unhygienic conditions where 30 inmates are being held in one room sharing one toilet. It is a violation of their human rights and Maroon's agreement with the state. Maroon is asking that all supporters call the office of Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf and demand his immediate unconditional release, as well as that of all elderly prisoners infected with COVID-19. Please call 717-787-2500 and keep the pressure on. Free Russell Maroon Schultz and all political prisoners. More of that post, including the call script, are linked from Chris Blebedeb, and we have that link in our show notes. Anarchist and anonymous hacker Jeremy Hammond has been released to a halfway house in his hometown of Chicago after over 10 years in prison, resisting a grand jury alongside Chelsea Manning and two bouts of COVID-19. Welcome home, Jeremy. Not sure when their next episode is due out, but Jeremy and his brother, Jason, both produce a podcast called Twin Trouble. They're a member of the Channel Zero Network. And you can hear an interview that we did with Jeremy for June 11th of this year at our website, linked in our show notes. Would you please introduce yourself to the audience with a name, a location, or a political affiliation? All right. So my name is Ivan. I'm an anarchist from Belarus. And I'm right now living in Germany. So the majority of the audience for this show is based in the U.S. And because of the strength and size of the uprising this summer in Belarus, a country will be much more visible and on the radar of the listening audience. But for those who need a refresher, could you paint us a bigger picture of Belarus, the position of Lukashenko, and what sparked the uprising of this year? Okay, so Belarus is the country in the Eastern Europe. Um, it was a country former Soviet Union Republic. After collapse, um, there were several years of the transition government, and in 1994, the first elections were held, and Lukashenko won the presidential seat. Um, This was the first and the only elections where people's votes were counted um, somehow in Belarus. And since 1994, he started accumulating power or consolidating the power in his own hands 
Um, so in the last 26 years, he was building up this dictatorship that was well known uh, all around the world. And mostly his dictatorship power was based on support of Russia, which was giving him credits, money, uh, political support as well. And Russia was doing that not only to Belarus, but to the most countries of the former Soviet Union to keep their political influence. So the, with Belarus, it was the same story. Uh, for, for quite some time, we were getting like cheap oil, cheaper than the market prices, cheaper gas. And um, for quite some time, it was going quite well and making the Belarusian economy grow and so on and so forth. But um, of course, the credits and of course, the political support um, is always goes both ways. So by the time Putin came to power and was ruling Russia for quite some time, he was also expecting loyalty from Belarus. And for quite some time, they started a project to actually include Belarus in some kind of a union state where we would have the same currency, the same borders, the same uh, political institutions and so on. And Lukashenko was not giving this power away. He still wanted to be a president because in the union state of Belarus and Russia, it is clear that Lukashenko won't be a president. Because of that, um, in the last five, six years, support for Lukashenko actually dropped from Putin. And he had to start finding, finding or searching for new sources of money and support, uh, which he found in European Union. So since 2015, European Union was kind of pumping money into Belarusian economy through different foundations through different projects, starting from the border guards, um, guarding projects for protecting against the migration and refugees, and ending up with uh, training the police forces, training the investigative uh, authorities, and so on, or ecology saving projects. So for quite some time, Lukashenko lost his position of the last dictator um, in, in Europe, because the European Union started working with him as a good friend and this was for european union this was connected with the story with ukraine that didn't work out so well and at the end of the day there was a civil war or still goes on um so for post maidan european union it was more reasonable to have lukashenko in power than to start organizing some kind of uprising and risk that belarus will lose or win um depending on whom you talk to, and the political situation will change in the region. And with that perspective, with dropping support from Russia and increasing support of the European Union, we are coming to 2020 right now, uh, when the corona crisis started. And corona crisis started, as you might have heard in Belarus, quite, well, later than in the most of the world. And this was with connected uh, with position of Lukashenko to completely ignore it. Um, in the first weeks, he was saying, we don't have it. Then he was saying, oh, yeah, we have it, but you can drive tractor and everything will be fine. Oh, tractor is not helping anymore. Uh, maybe you should drink vodka and go to sauna. Um, so this kind of development was happening in the political sphere, but in the social sphere, people were suffering from coronavirus, of, of course, and people were dying. And to address this neglect from the government, basically like, absence of the government in struggle against the coronavirus. People started building up um, structures by themselves, like on the horizontal level. Um, they started creating funds that would gather money from Belarus and outside to support the medical personnel um, or building up some neighborhood uh, groups that would support the people who are in need. So a lot of things that were happening in the other countries as well. But in Belarus, it was way more accumulated because the government completely abandoned the society in the first months of coronavirus. And with the parallel creation of the social infrastructure that didn't exist for years, um, the anger started building up against the government, against Lukashenko, who didn't do anything. And um, this was fueled even more by the fact that um, the government announced that there will be elections in August, and this provoked a huge political movement, let's say, of the people who were not only politically active, 
continuously and traditionally, but a huge amount of people who were not politically active, but got involved in politics through the social organizing. Um, I wouldn't say that they were all super progressive and anarchists, socialists, communists, whatever. Many of them were liberals and were thinking that, well, the European Union did quite well in the struggle against coronavirus. So all of those people came together. And that's how it started building up the momentum to the elections that happened in uh, 9th of August. Apart from that, Lukashenko actually made quite big mistakes in um, repressing the movement. For quite some time, they were ignoring it completely because women were in charge of the, let's say, mobilization of the society. And Lukashenko thought that women do not have any influence on the society. So how can he lose to the women? As a result of that, as a result of ignoring his opponents, uh, we came to 9th of August with a massive mobilization with thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were eager to go to the streets, who were eager to protest him. And this was, I think, the biggest mobilization we've seen um, so far through whole his political career with tens of thousands of people protesting at the day of uh, elections all around the country. So in the elections... Lukashenko's government claimed that they had like 80% of the vote to continue him in the position of, of the president. This isn't the first election where they've claimed to have 80% and maybe the numbers didn't didn't pan out that way, right? Was it just the coronavirus that sparked this time being the final time that they would put up with? I think it, coronavirus played quite an important role that the government underestimated to provoke people for protest. And economical problems that are, that were growing for quite some time, um, it all got somehow together and mixed up. Traditionally, elections in Belarus is some kind of a high point of politics. Most of the liberal groups, most of the oppositional groups kind of ignore the political life or they're repressed and they can't participate in the political life. But during the election campaigns, traditionally goes into like, okay, now we can talk about politics. Now we can criticize Lukashenko. Maybe we'll go to prison, but we will try to criticize him. And this time it was kind of the same. It was a little bit different in 2015, where most of the opposition actually said, okay, we will have a calm elections. We are not going to protest um, because we don't want to have Maidan. We don't want to have the civil war. We don't want to have Putin in Belarus. Back then, there was this trauma, let's say like that, right? But um, in 2020, new politicians um, and new kind of a fresh energy in the movement. And as a result of that, people started with the new energy to actually bring down the government. And it seems like folks online uh, communicating throughout the pandemic, including over mediums like Telegram, have, have led to a greater opportunity of the population to, like, for instance, verify election numbers or to share the experience, the shared experiences of opposition and experiences other than what the government propaganda has been of what life in Belarus is like. Can you talk about peer-to-peer -peer communication, both in person, through technology, or in crowds, and how it helped to spread the protests autonomously? I think, starting with the coronavirus, uh, a lot of people were provoked to search for another means of information on the virus itself, on the epidemic situation in the country. And that means that even the people who were traditionally consuming the governmental media, they had to go away from that into, well, in that case, to Telegram or to other social networks that were mostly oppositionally somehow minded uh, because they were disagreeing with the numbers that were given by the, by the health officials, for example. Um, so this provoked like the first wave of the people migrating to the social networks again away from the contact and the Facebook, but to Telegram, which is a little bit more dynamic. And there, a lot of organizing with about the money, about the water resources, about the food happened. And this was really done by the people who had no experience also. It is not like professionals who can come from the NGOs and who know how to deal with the things. Rather than just on pure enthusiasm, people started organizing and creating these horizontal structures. Um, so this was really, I think, a great thing that happened to the Belarusian society. Um, but at the same time, by the time the uprising happened and by the time the news were 
spreading quite fast. Um, we saw that when the government starts interfering really proactively and Russian troll factory and the Belarusian troll factory, which is a little bit smaller, um, can disrupt communication in the social networks to the extent where you can't talk to each other anymore in the open places because there's so much communication happening, so much spam communication happening. Um, the people um, understood that there is a huge role of the meeting one-on-one -on -one or meeting together. And I think um, this was one of the ways that provoked this neighborhood assemblies, that the people went away from, okay, we can communicate and we can organize in the social networks to, okay, we... The, the easiest way to verify people in Telegram, the easiest way to know that you are talking to the real person and not to some crazy person who's working in the office eight hours tweeting the whole day, is just basically going to the street and talking to those people. And that's how this neighborhood assembly started. Um, some of them went in the direction of just talking, organizing some parties, getting to know each other, building up this social glue that was destroyed by the dictatorship through this 26 years. But others went further. So they had like a couple of parties and then they understood, oh yeah, the parties are good, but hey, we want to have something bigger. And there are several neighborhoods where the people made like uh, open statements of the neighborhood um, independence or autonomy from the government and so on and so forth. So this is also an important way of building up this horizontal structures. However, if you are lacking this initiative people who might be interested in developing those structures, you can be stuck on the level of just communicating, having fun, and so on and so forth. And that's what we see right now, that there is quite a huge contrast between the neighborhoods where you have certain people that you can describe as activists of the neighborhood assemblies and the other neighborhoods where people are really far away from any kind of political organizing. How does geography affect the way that the uprising has panned out in Belarus in terms of population concentrations in cities other than the capital versus and and how repression has been has panned out like i know that uh at the beginning there was a lot of worry by the government of people coming from smaller cities into the capital in order to disrupt the center um and people were playing with the idea of do we disrupt our city where we are do we try to move to the centralized place and sort of reproduce the way that power is uh, assembled in the society I think to understand or to, to go for that question, uh, it's important to mention that Belarus is, the, is a, quite a small country. It's just 10 million people, 2 million, 2 million and a half is living in the capital. So one fifth or one fourth of the population is in the capital. And there are uh, five big cities that have also uh, one quarter of the whole population together. Um, and most of the protests in the first days was happening all around the country. It was actually first time when the protest was so widespread and it was happening in the cities where the protest was never happening before in the history, not only of Republic of Belarus, but in the history of the Soviet Union as well. Um, so those places were also standing up or going into uprising. And there were, I think, 50 plus cities that were organizing demonstrations in the first day at the 9th of August. And many of them, of those cities, had actually clashes with the police and the people managed to kind of throw the cops away from the city for some time because the government thought that it won't get so decentralized and they brought all the police to the capital. Because traditionally that was what's happening. Everybody goes to the capital, we all protest together and at the night of the elections we all go home and that's the end of the story. Uh, this time, decentralization helped to actually spread the fire all around the country. And that's why the government didn't, or the regime, didn't manage to suppress it so fast. The repressions in Minsk were quite hard, and um, a lot of people were arrested. But at the same time, the success of the protest in the smaller cities managed to create the momentum that somehow pushed all the three months. And the government understood that. So after the first kind of hardcore days of the suppression in Minsk and several other cities, they backed down 
and started from the and started repressing from the very small cities. So first they went to the cities where there was population, maybe 10,000, 20,000 people, and uh, repressed the smaller movements there. Then they saw, okay, this movement died out. They went into the bigger cities and did the same, while at the same time allowing the peaceful demonstrations in the big cities. Minsk was enjoying this 100, 200,000 people demonstrations for over two months without big arrests, without the big repressions that are happening right now. Um, so they suppressed the regions first, managed to kind of keep, uh, get them under control, and only then they moved to the capital. And at that time, when the regional protests were basically destroyed, people started going to, the, to Minsk as well. Um, so this was feeding the protest in Minsk as well, making it still going on. But at the same time, we, uh, we could see that the dying out of the protests in the smaller cities was actually, was actually helping the government to, re to relieve the forces that they were lacking in the first weeks. And now we see that the protests in Minsk are suppressed again by the regional cops as well. So they are not only using the capital forces, uh, but also bringing police forces from the smaller towns to suppress the protests. So these protests have been running, at least, if nothing else, um, every Sunday for quite a while. How are the numbers in the streets now and what's the, the level of repression that people are facing? Because people have been engaging in like widespread like fight uh, against uh, water cannons from police, against like snatch squads, um, you know, against torture uh, and, and, and rape um, in police stations. What, what's it like right now? Um, right now we got a new chief of the um, Minister of Internal Affairs and he is clearly like working his out to be no noticed and become even bigger person in the whole government. Since the first day he started, the repressions increased. And if traditionally you would have a march on Sunday where there would be 100,000 plus people, maybe some troubles with the police, a little bit of a hustle here and there. Uh, when he came, they just started like shooting into the crowds, throwing the grenades again, throwing the stun grenades again. Um, so it went like full scale escalative. And last three weeks, it was like just basically escalated demonstrations where more and more people getting detained. And we had two weeks ago, I think around 1000 people arrested, detained and uh, prosecuted through the um, police forces. And this, uh, this Sunday, we had also 1150 people. So the arrests are also growing. And the participation of the people is dropping really rapidly because everybody sees that okay if i go on the streets there is a huge possibility that i will that i will get arrested and there are no big crowds that are protecting me so last sunday there were maybe ten thousand people which is also huge like for belarus ten thousand people is extremely huge crowd but at the same time when you had for two months crowds of 100,000, 150,000 people you feel like oh the protest is dying out or we are losing and so on and so forth and, of course, the violence from the police that escalated and the murder of the protester um, last week created quite a lot of decline in the mood of the protest. People are not feeling any more so strong together rather than um, they're all destroyed. And, I mean, this is also affected not only by repressions, but we got back coronavirus and coronavirus is a huge fucking pain in the ass for the society where the government is not dealing with it, right? So we have a little bit the same situation as it was um, in, in spring, where people have to deal from one side with the epidemic, but from the other side with the dictatorship that is trying to destroy the society in any way it tries to organize. And also we see people who are getting detained and getting like the administrative arrests, which would last like 15, 25 days. Those people coming out of prison, many of them are actually coming out of coronavirus. So there is an epidemic of coronavirus inside of the prison system, which everybody ignores because the prisoners are nobody. Um, but for the protesters, if before you would get arrested for 15 days, you need like two, three days to relax and then you can jump in back into the game. Right now you need like weeks to recover um, from the coronavirus and to get back to the protest. And that, that protester who died is Roman Bondarenko, is that right? Yeah. 
and died from severe beating from the police. So you mentioned how small the country is um, compared to a lot of other places around the world. And a few months ago, hackers released doxes or troves of personal information about cops in Belarus. And in a smaller place, it seems like it's easier to pinpoint which neighbors of yours are bootlicker cops. This was after there were already a lot of documented instances of police ditching their uniforms and joining the protests, although obviously a lot of them have continued um, repressing the population. But what what has been the, the effect that you've seen of the doxes? And have there been non-demonstration protests against police or attacks on police property or that, that you're aware of? Or has the doxing and the embarrassment led to a continued dropping of, of um, uniforms by former officers? Um, one thing to say is that the whole doxing with the police was happening um, before even the elections. And certain groups of anarchists were collecting information, for example, against the cops um, who were participating in the repressions against the anarchists. And the cops even created their own doxing channel where they would um, unravel the facts about the anarchists. So this was happening even years before, right? But this was on the small scale. And um, the whole uh, release of information about the police happened not with the help of the hackers at the beginning, but with the help of the neighbors and the other cops. Um, so I think a couple of days after the protests, on 11th of August, the initiative was started, Belarusian Punishers on Telegram. And they started collecting the data on the police officers that were involved in suppressing demonstrations. And they got tons and tons of information from all around the society, where those cops live, what are their uh, um, cars, and so on and so forth. And you have to understand that this started happening when this phase of really like escalative protest was happening. So a lot of cops got scared because this was like the moment where people were fighting with the cops on the streets. And they thought, okay, I'm next. They're going to come to me to my house. And this provoked this wave of the videos where the cops are dropping their uniform in the trash and so on and so forth. But after a couple of weeks, when the protest went more de-escalative or peaceful, this whole wave of uh, retirement kind of died out. And after one month, the amount of the cops that, are, that were quitting their job was just fingers on one hand. But at the same time, the de-anonymization continued, right? So people thought, okay, we will continue publishing this. We will continue keeping pressure. Anarchists actually use this database to build up an interactive map where you can just go into your neighborhood and see, okay, the cop is living in this house, in this house, in this house, and this and this cop is living and responsible for that, these things. And this worked quite well. Because people started, for example, putting leaflets on the entrances to the houses of the cops, or they started making graffitis and started putting more and more pressure, not directly where they would beat them up, but more, we know what you did, we know who you are, and so on. And um, there were news, for example, that the families were leaving from the cops because there was too much pressure. Mm -hmm. um, later on, when the repressions against the protesters went higher again, the certain groups started using those databases to actually attack the cops. So there were situations not directly beating up the cops, but there were uh, situations where people were burning down the police cars. Um, there were situations where people were following the cops or something like that. Um, but this is also is not a mass movement. This is mostly like individual cases. Maybe in three months, there would be like 15, 20 cases um, of such direct actions. But at the same time, the database is still getting filled up further and further and further. And I think it is building up quite a lot of pressure on the cops because when the things escalate, if they escalate, we are way better prepared than we were before. So if the, if the street fights start happening again, we have the huge database of, let's say, people responsible for what is happening on the streets. And this can provoke quite a lot of violence. And I think the cops understand that perfectly. And that's why they're moving, for example, their families out of the flats into the flats where they are not registered. Or um, in the case of like top rank cops and politicians, they have guards that are basically like guarding the 
inner yards of the houses where those people are living 24-7. Um, so they are basically also dropping a lot of forces into protecting the top of the regime. Yeah, and they don't get to sleep comfortably. They have to know that exactly. people don't want them to sleep at all or forever. So anarchists don't generally propose replacing presidential republics with liberal democracies. Can you talk about the tensions and roles anarchists have played in the uprising against the regime and with protesters who want a new government? I, I mean, we had quite a funny story with the liberals in Belarus for a really long time. Um, it went up to the point that in somewhere in 2000s, we had one year a really successful demonstration together. And the next year, because the liberals saw that a lot of their supporters actually went to the anarchists, they said, OK, we are going to use the police forces to repress the anarchists, not to participate anymore in our demonstrations. Um, and I think right now it's kind of the same that a lot of liberals see that anarchists are kind of a forces that they can use to bring down to the government. And we also understand that, that this union is really temporary and the new masters will come and create troubles for us. So what is our position in this uprising is that we are not for liberal democracy. We are more against the dictatorship. We are against the centralization of power as it is in such an amount that there could be el presidente or the great leader or whatever, the father. And this is our main goal. So to bring down the dictatorship, what comes afterwards is somehow an opportunistic position where we say, yeah, the liberals will come for sure, but we keep the side of the, or the perspective of Bakunin, where the liberal democracy, any kind of liberal democracy is better than the dictatorship. Yeah, we don't have illusions about the liberal democracies. We do not have illusion about capitalism uh, because capitalism is already there in Belarus. Uh, but at the same time, we find it important to bring down the, uh, the dictatorship to come to this point in the society, in, in the history of Belarusian society, where we understand our power. Because through the Soviet Union period, and there's the dictatorship period, we were always told as a society, we do not matter, we do not have power, we do not, we cannot change what is happening in the world. And through this revolution, through this uprising, we are building up the power that can, you know, maybe today it will bring down the dictatorship and liberals will come to power. But tomorrow, it can be the power that will bring down the liberal democracy and the fucking capitalism and bring, uh, bring back anarchism. And I think it is important for us to participate in those uh, protests because people see our ideas, they see that we are for real, that we are not this face, two-faced liberals that are playing the game and then going to sell everybody as soon as they are in power. We are the people who are there on the streets and who are going to stay on the streets. Even if Tikhanovska, the new president, comes to power, we will be on the streets. And for, the, for a lot of people, this is a really important part. And apart from that, Belarus and, and dictatorship managed to suppress most of the liberals in the country. There are no organized properly organized liberal groups anymore in, in Belarus. Most of them are in exile somewhere outside of the country or doing like video blocks and that's it. And anarchists and anti-fascists are the only organized groups that are present on the streets with their flags, with their slogans, with their attributes or whatever. And this is also building up a really interesting momentum where people would come to you and say, hey, I don't support your anarchist ideas yet, but you are doing like an awesome job and we are like 100% for you and you can see that if repressions are hitting anarchists everybody runs to us and like we are supporting you you are like awesome people and so on and so forth so you've kind of touched on already what my next question question was going to be in terms of that a lot of the liberal organizing elements are already in exile um, for fear or from facing repression but have have you seen other Western or neoliberal interventions um, in the protests via NGOs trying to ferment a color revolution, or does that seem likely a threat to popular power in demonstrations, co-optation by liberals? So far, this was not really happening. And this was not really happening because um, the European Union and US, which are like traditional sponsors of this colored revolutions, were not really interested in what is happening in Belarus. They were trying to sit on two chairs, basically. 
um, because they understood that if they support Tikhanovskaya full scale, if they support the uprising as well, full scale, and they lose, then Lukashenko will move to Russia. And if they start supporting Lukashenko, well, this will be a really bad picture. So they were just waiting for a really long time. And it was always this kind of, we are concerned, we are concerned, and so on and so forth. And this traditional schemes where they would pump a lot of money into NGOs, and NGOs try to organize, this was not happening in Belarus. This was also destroyed through this five years of cooperation between Belarus and the European Union, where a lot of money started being kind of rerouted from traditional NGOs or political, oppositional political parties into reform projects inside of Belarus that were basically run by the government to get those money. So right now we don't see so much of um, intervention, let's say like that, from, from the Western powers, because another part to understand that they need partners, partners that would be at the ground who would be capable of doing something. And they do not have these partners in Belarus. Most of the NGOs that were active are closed or in exile, as well as liberals. And the only partner that they have right now is this Tikhanovska voted president or whatever. And she's outside of the country and she has little influence on what is happening directly on the streets. Yeah. And I think Donald Trump's position in Belarus also played an important role. Because he's a friend of Putin. Putin, I don't think that he told him directly, don't intervene in Belarus. But it was clear that position of US was kind of, let's say, moderate in comparison to the previous big repressions that were happening in the country in 2010. And I mean, the color revolution right now is also not really possible because the protest is got so decentralized that there is no control points where you can just enter and say, okay, we are taking over. Okay, we can push the wagon in this direction or in that direction. So as with many conversations that we've had on the show, speaking with comrades engaged in struggle against authoritarian regimes, the question of Western tankies comes up. Can you talk about how, if if you use this term, how you define a tanky, what they promote about the situation in Belarus and what they get wrong and why? Also, are there any specific media sources uh, that you think are points of disinformation that people should be aware of? We don't really use the word tankies or something like that. It's a really funny English word. And it has its own, I think, story behind. And for us, it's mostly like authoritarian communists. And um, talking about Belarus or Russia, this is mostly connected with the Communist Party of Belarus or Russia. And in Belarus, the Communist Party is a bunch of old people who still dream that Stalin will raise up, or Lenin, depending on ideology, will raise up from mausoleum and lead us to the bright future. Um, so those kind of topics are not really present in the anarchist movement of Belarus at all. And we are getting actually confronted by them only through kind of cooperation with the West and comrades. And that's where the story is about the madness of the tankies and their information bubbles appear. And I think, I mean, Judging from what was happening in Ukraine and Maidan and with all this hysteria that Maidan is a fascist coup, there is a lot of work done not only by clear authoritarian leftist groups in the West, but also um, at that point from the Russian side. A lot of leftists, as I understand, in, in, in Europe and I don't know about US, but in Europe, are consuming Russia Today, for example or um, some other news channels that are coming, well, directly or indirectly from Russian side. Um, this is one of the main sources of misinformation or disinformation to give this completely different reality. And it worked like charm. There is, it's basically, there are two realities. You can watch Russia today and you will understand that there is a brighter world where everything is fine. From the other side, I think you still have in Europe this traditional left authoritarian left, authoritarian communists, Trotskyists, Maoists, which doesn't exist so much in, in Belarus or in Russia um, itself. And those are existing for generations. And their narrative was always like pro-Russian, pro-Putin. Belarus is kind of a Putin's influence zone. So whatever happens in Belarus and whatever tries to be changed is always... Um, reaches this hysteria of, oh, the West is trying to destroy the Belarusian socialist state. 
And um, it's, it's, I think it has little to do with the facts and it has way more to do with ideological war. For the people, it is not important what is happening in Belarus. And if you talk to those people, you can see that the arguments are not playing any importance here. There is a clear ideology and everything is fitted into one or the other ideology. And in case of tankies, there is this myth that Belarus is a socialist state where there is a free health care, where there is, uh, I don't know, free education. The great leader has moustache and everything is beautiful. Which is, I mean, not the case. If, even if you know a little bit about what is happening economically and socially in the country, you, you would give up this narrative. But the people don't want, they want to have these castles that would fit in their ideological pool and they would stay there forever. And for us, from one side, there is a certain damage done um, by those people. But I think um, a lot of people already got it, like, they got that this is like the stupidest swamp where you can ever end up and there is no future there. I'm talking about the authoritarian communists and people are giving up those perspectives, hopefully really fast. And joining anarchists, like everybody should join anarchists because there is a really clear um, only proof facts and a beautiful future, right? You already kind of touched on fears, at least among like, NGOs or, or liberals that have that have that are operating from abroad, who are from Belarus, uh, fears of a sort of Maidan collapse situation. And yeah, I'm wondering of the people in the streets. Are there people like it seems like people in the streets have like obviously the situation in Ukraine was different, but as a former part of the Soviet Union and within, as you said, like the realm of influence of Putin since Lukashenko was formerly like of the Soviet Communist Party. And I'm wondering, like, is there a fear among the the population of the protesters of the country breaking down into a civil war scenario or of Putin actually sending like committing troops? Well, the story with sending the troops started actually just a couple of days after the elections because the whole shit was going so crazy for Lukashenko that he started calling Putin and saying, bring me the, 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 the military, bring me the police and so on. Uh, there is some kind of a military agreement between certain countries of the former Soviet Union to um, have some kind of um, military protection so they can bring the forces in for terrorist situation. And Putin actually, after a month, brought a lot of police forces to the Belarusian border as kind of playing muscle situation. But Putin is not a fool. Although he rides a horse without a t-shirt, he's not a fool. And although he's a friend with, the, with uh, Donald Trump. And he knows how the situation played for him in Ukraine, where starting of the civil war actually produced such an kind of push back from the whole Ukrainian population that right now he's hated in the whole Ukraine, basically. And for him doing the same mistake in Belarus and getting dragged into another civil war is seems like not worth it. He doesn't like Lukashenko so much. They are not really great friends to, you know, commit yourself to friendship so much that you start a civil war. And he, in this last three months, was keeping quite uh, quite calm and quite distant. So there were no such big statements every week where he's like, we support our great leader in Belarus, let him live really long and drink a lot of vodka. He was not doing that. And this is not typical for him because normally he would support his authoritarian partners as strong as he can. Um, so that one part. From the other side, Putin also understands that if he goes into Belarus, he has no future in kind of occupying the country because he will get a war, basically. And maybe he will win it. Maybe he will force people into submission. But at the same time, it will cost him a lot of political points. And I'm not sure that he's ready for doing that. So Putin is staying outside of the whole game. But at the same time, we see that Lukashenko right now is escalating uh, the narrative more and more. And he's, if three, uh, three months ago, his support base, which was maybe 10, 20% of the population, 
was not really capable of doing something on the street. Right now, he is actually at least arming, let's say what you would call the top echelons of power, the people who are going on the streets and beating out people and so on and so forth. So he's mobilizing those people. And it seems like that for him, the narrative of the civil war is not something that he is pushing away. And he is like, we're not going to have that. And he's trying to say that. Even the police forces, uh, the, the former chief of the of the police or internal minister was actually saying, we have a war right now on the streets and the cops are allowed to use the firearms on the streets. So outside of Putin, the, the, the Belarusian government is now actually looking into possibility of the civil war and trying to mobilize people to um, somehow be able to protect the Belarusian regime from the crowds of the other side, the peaceful side. Apart from that, we see also mobilization of certain groups of people, and this is like former police forces, former militaries, to join the self-defense groups for the Belarusian government that would have some kind of semi-police forces patrolling the streets. And a couple of days um, ago, there was uh, a map of capital leaked where it would have, people are already calling it ghettos, um, a certain neighborhoods that are, well, that are famous for their protest potential. And they are supposed to be some kind of a hot zones where the police will be more present, this self-defense groups will be more present, and there most probably will be more force use and so on and so forth. Right. But we don't we don't see for now the Maidan scenario happening in Belarus, especially like after Maidan scenario where the pro-Russian forces were so strong. So this coming week, November 23rd to 30th, there's been a call for an international week of solidarity with anarchists and anti-fascists in the struggle called for by the Anarchist Black Cross of Belarus. What sorts of solidarity are being sought? What are some examples of activities that some might participate in? And if someone wanted to donate, where could they do that? All right. So um, solidarity actions. What kind of solidarity actions can you do? Uh, people know traditionally that they're dropping banners, doing the posters, doing like pictures together and so on and so forth. And this is great. Actually sending the pictures of those solidarity actions is something that can keep the spirit um, still going up because there was a little bit less interest in the last months where the cops' cars were not burning and nobody was rioting. So the international community was not really paying so much attention to what was happening in Belarus. I'm not calling for any legal actions, right? Because this is forbidden on the radio. But I can give you an example. For example, in uh, 2010, people in Petersburg occupied Belarusian embassy for some time. And this was a great solidarity action. I don't know. They thought that this was great. I also thought that it was funny. Um, so you can actually do a lot of things that can somehow affect the Belarusian policies abroad. And apart from the embassies, there is a lot going on economically or socially as well, starting with the Belarusian diaspora as well. As for um, donating money, you can just go to the website of Anarchist Black Cross Belarus, just type it in your search engine of choice, and there's a huge button support or donate or something like that. Just click there and you will have like thousands of possibilities how you can donate money. And this is something, one of the ways. And the other way, there is a fundraising campaign started at the Fire Fund, which is like an activist crowdfunding platform from Denmark, um, where you can also donate. And this money, if you donate to ABC Belarus, this is mostly for legal support and for the things that are connected with the repressions. And the Fire Fund campaign is actually for, let's say, activist organizing, for organizing infrastructure, for organizing underground flats, and so on and so forth. Right. So this is the two ways you can donate. You can do the solidarity actions. You can do some creative solidarity actions. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZ. I'm going to make those pompous academics regret kicking up such a genius. Deciding to build my lab and do my research. The Time Talks Podcast. Have you ever stared at a 500-page book and wish you could just talk to the author about their ideas instead? 
If so, the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network, is for you. Where we discuss history, politics, music, and art with an anti-authoritarian and anarchist perspective. The Time Talks podcast. What's this light? I feel different. The Time Talks podcast. In an earlier interview that I heard um, with an anarchist from Belarus, an anonymous anarchist, they were talking about the sort of tools that were being used for repression by the uh, Belarusian state. And that included, say, like motor vehicles that were sold to the police forces from, I think, Germany, like tear gas that was produced in another country. There was all this like very clear, like these tools for repression are sold at a profit to the repressive regime. Now, I got to say, like, America's pretty great. We have a very strong economy. We produce a lot of things. Weapons, tear gas, these are, these are things that we have earned a very strong name for producing and selling abroad. For listeners in the U.S. audience, are there any specific corporations operating in the United States that have a distinctive and nefarious interest in the Belarusian regime? Well, I don't know about any weapons. I know that the water cannons are coming from Canada, which is not part of US, as I've heard so far. Not officially. Um, not officially, right. But, and and most of the weapons are actually um, coming from Europe. Like, for example, the tear gas is from Czech and the cars, as you said, Germany, really great cars, Volkswagen for people. Um, but but what is really funny and what is not getting so much attention, funny in a, in a kind of a Belarusian funny way, uh, Microsoft is um, playing quite a huge role in a court system right now due to the fact that Belarusian government is arresting every week thousands of people. They gave up bringing people to the courts and all of the courts are organized via Skype. So everybody's Skyping each other. And um, I think Microsoft never positioned themselves on how does it feel to use to, to actually help Belarusian dictatorship. But this can be one of the, let's say, targets um, for your protest. Microsoft Corporation that is basically running Belarusian infrastructure. And there was another company that sold... Um, a huge chunk of equipment and software for um, uh, for censorship that you put on your basically internet line and you can drop the packets and so on, which was used at the beginning of August. Um, the government completely shut down internet and their equipment was used for that. I don't know the name of it, but I think it, it was also all around the internet. Plus, uh, the the great corporation that everybody runs around with this Apple thing, right? Um, the beaten one. Um, they are participating in 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 attempt to actually force Telegram to block the channels that are doing doxing on the police. And this was also a huge outcry a couple of months ago. But I think everybody like kind of dropped it. I'm not sure how the story ended. But basically, they wanted Telegram to shut down the channels that are publishing information on the Belarusian cops that were murdering or torturing people, which was a huge kind of interference in the political protests that were happening in Belarus. So those three companies, one of which I can't name. The the censorship companies called Sandvine Incorporated or at least that's what they were called in September when Bloomberg and some other companies and like media um, reported on them. Let's see. So as we speak about anarchists facing repression in Belarus, I wonder if you have anything to tell about uh, Mikola Dedok, an anarchist and former political prisoner arrested on November 13th and beaten and being implicated in the existing case of Oh, actually, well, before I ask this question, can you talk about the cases of um, some of the anarchists that are specifically facing repression, such as the so-called anarchist partisans? This is a group of people that are anarchists for a really long time. And it's kind of a, most of them actually have experience with the repressions that is beyond just a couple of weeks in the prison. So they got together in, somewhere in Belarus Two of them were outside of Belarus for a really long time, and they crossed the border illegally and got together in Belarus and decided, okay, we will be partisans. And they started doing partisan actions. So they uh, were moving through the woods 
and entering certain cities and attacking um, the regime infrastructure. In one case, this was in Soligorsk, which is like a miner's town, where they burned down cars of the investigator's office and some other building, which was also part of the police uh, repression infrastructure in solidarity with the miners, with the striking miners that were repressed quite heavily by the police uh, at that point. And then they burned down the um, road police station in a smaller town, which is called Mozir, not far away from the Ukrainian border, which were where they were arrested a couple of days later. And traditionally, these actions are actually interpreted as, uh, well, arson or arson with weapons and so on and so forth. Igor Elinievich, for example, was in prison for kind of exactly the same actions in 2010 for eight years. And Dmitry Dubovsky was on the run for this 10 years um, since 2010 um, for the same actions that were uh, prosecuted under completely different articles. But because of the political atmosphere in the, in, in, this, in the society, Lukashenko said that those are terrorist acts and they should be prosecuted as such. And that's how you go. So the prosecutor's office started the terrorist attack. And as a result of that, they are not right now sitting in KGB prison and charged with uh, terrorist articles. There was for some time a little bit concern, well, a little bit, a huge concern that terrorist article is one of the few articles in Belarusian penal code that allows um, death penalty. And we thought, okay, this is actually can happen. But recently they got charged with uh, part of this article that is not mentioning the death penalty, only up to 20 years, which was like a positive news so far. Two other people who are in prison right now is uh, Dmitry Dizanovich, who was um, uh, in prison in, in, in Russia for quite some time for illegal crossing the border and trying to participate in Maidan. And Dmitry Romanov was in prison for five years for possession of explosives. Um, so they are the people who have kind of a history with this partisan concept of struggle. And they are right now in prison, hold into this position that they are kind of a partisan anarchists who came to fight for the Belarusian revolution. Like, obviously, the state is going to be producing a lot of propaganda to, to make their argument. But how have the protests engaged with these actions or with the, the cases that are coming up around them? Well, when the action started, oh, well, not started, happened, this burning down of the police cars, burning down the, the expertise office, burning down the Mosul police all the news agencies were posting it and the blogging platforms that are not media and actually allow themselves to be certain politically positioned, all the major ones were really cheering it. It was like an awesome thing. It was really great. So when the people got arrested, it was also a certain cheering effect for them that they were seen as heroes of the Belarusian resistance movement from one side. So everybody were really happy with them in the sense of that they are great people. But from the other side, uh, there was a certain group of people that were disappointed that all of those actions were done by one group because everybody were hoping that there are, you know, like multiply, uh, multiple groups that are doing direct actions all around the country, but it was just one group. And right now when they're in prison, they're still enjoying quite a lot of public support for what they've done. Um, especially from, well, the people on the streets and people who are um, directly involved in some kind of political organizing. But at the same time, so far, their example didn't produce, you know, like dozens and dozens of uh, radical groups that are ready to do the same thing um, in the same manner. As we're speaking about anarchists facing repression in Belarus, I also wonder if you could, um, if you have anything to tell about Mikola Dedak. Uh, an anarchist and former political prisoner arrested on November 13th, beaten and implicated in an existing case of organizing and preparing actions that grossly violate public order, quote unquote, according to a post on Athens Indie Media by Abtin Parsa. So Mikola is an anarchist blogger. He was not participating on actions on the streets for quite some time, and he was mostly involved in spreading the information on the internet. 
And one of his important parts of his work was struggle against this special department of the police that is dealing with the political crimes, which is a f***ing, I don't know, uh, a story of its own. You can write a book there. There's funny stories where they lose hundreds of thousands of euros and so on. And he was reporting on them quite a lot with a really offensive manner, right? Making fun of them as well and so on and so forth. And this was happening parallel to the uprising that was happening right now. So for Belarusian regime, he became quite a high priority target. And um, for quite some time since even before the uprising, even before the elections, he was already on the run, hiding in some undercover flats. And when they got him, nobody knows how, it was also partly a punishment. So he was beaten up really heavily just because he was writing about those cops that actually got him at that point. And um, there is, uh, the, the, his lawyer told him, told his story that while beating him up, one of the cops comes and they are still beating him up and they are stopping the beating up and saying like, okay, now you have to give us an officer uh, on our word that you will never write anything about us, which is like a stupid f***ing crazy sh that people can do to torture you, you know? They torture you to get information from you. They torture you to get encrypted inf uh, drives. And then they torture you to give an officer's honor word, which is a complete bullshit. But eventually that's what happened. He was tortured, I think, for like 12 hours or something like that and forced to say that he loves his country on the video. And right now he is in prison just waiting for further prosecution. He got quite messed up for this torturing procedures. But in general, right now, he's doing quite well, um, quite well, depending on um, relative to what is happening in the country at all. And I guess you can find out more about other cases up at uh, abc-belarus.org. So in case you missed it, the USA just had an election, including for president, uh, that greatly divided the voting population ideologically. It, it was already divided before that, but it sort of did show this very wide ideological split in the United States. The Trump administration has, for over a year now, stated that it would reject any outcome that wasn't a victory as corrupted and stolen, and that it has it's been preparing its base and many members of that party to resist through courts and possibly in the streets through voter intimidation or disruption and violence after the election. This is obviously a much different situation than Belarus. However, for anarchists in the U.S., we face what might be a similar predicament. What lessons do you think can be taken by anarchists and other anti-authoritarians who don't believe in a system like the U.S. Constitutional Republic, but might find themselves engaging in a fight against a possible right-wing coup or putsch alongside liberal or centrist forces? Are there any lessons for autonomy that you can suggest? Whew. Well, we, we've heard about elections in the U.S. a little bit, every day, every f***ing hour of every whatever day in the last weeks. And I think... It is a really interesting story because you can see what happens in the U.S. happened in Belarus in the 90s. And the difference is a big country is harder to basically take over than the uh, Belarusian 10 million people. And I think it is really hard to give really good advices apart from Sure, work with the liberals and they will stab you in the back when the, the fight is over. But I think it is really important not to try to be purist in the sense of, okay, these people are not anarchists, so I'm not going to look at them even or talk to them. Rather understand that in certain situations we are ending up, well, for a short period of time on the same side. And it's also important to understand that they are not your friends, they're not your comrades, they are um, th talking about liberals, right? They might be temporal political allies in the struggle. And this can change a little bit your perspective, that you're not going to expect from them to be anarchists. They're not, you are not going to expect them to be anti-fascist even. But you know that in this situation, this is required to stop the bigger evil, and you are not going to give up your political principles or your political directions. But I think if Trump tries to raise arms against uh, the, let's say, the abstract US population and try to actually by force run the country, then it is, for me at least, it's not even a good question to ask whether people should 
arm themselves and try to fight back, but rather that you should you should start talking about the way you are going to do that. And most probably the liberals are not going to be your best friends. But as we see in, in Belarus scenario, for example, if there is a common goal and we see, okay, there is a huge f-ing fascist coup, then even liberals aren't actually supporting anarchists in certain situations. Though I wouldn't count on that a lot. But at the same time, I wouldn't try to spit in their direction at that point and maybe more focus on actually bringing down the problems that the authoritarian government is bringing in the White House or wherever they're going to sit. I don't know. I mean, what is your expectations actually right now in US? Is it possible that that the militia will go on the streets and start shooting people or taking over the cities? No, I think it's pretty unlikely to, to sort of echo something that was on another English language podcast, the IGD cast recently, where the commentator said that it in order for a coup to actually succeed, it would have had to have started actually centralizing power before this point. And the administration has been so uh, inept that it hasn't been able to do that. So it's, I I kind of feel like, and I may be not giving enough, enough respect to the president, the commander in chief, but I think that they've, they've missed their opportunity. They're trying to use a, a legal approach to basically extend the this period of questioning until the new administration can start stepping in and taking its role. They're doing that for as long as they can to be able to to have leverage to maybe get immunity for the president and some of and his family on some possibly looming charges. Uh, and and meanwhile there are elements of the far right, the autonomous far right that have been coordinating demonstrations in various state capitals, there has been some violence associated with that. And while the numbers have the numbers in DC this last weekend were, or by the time this airs two weekends ago, they were 10 times as large as the unite the right rally in 2017. Um, and there were a few stabbings of anti-racists and, and black activists that came out of it. It doesn't seem like they're actually going to be able to do anything this time around. They might, however, be building up towards a post Trump future scenario where the militias and the autonomous armed right wing uh, with the support of certain elements of the of the electoral right in the United States has enough of a basis to to pressure change they've I mean like a part of their wider <laughs> sorry I could keep going <laughs> mm-hmm. you know but a, a part of no, their, no, like it's, it's interesting yeah a, a part of their wider strategy of some parts of the administration has been like on one side, strengthen the centrality of the of the executive and hand over as much power into that one set of hands as possible at a federal level. And yet there's also been a push from local levels to install more or to grab more power from local sheriffs as as the basis for law enforcement in local areas and sort of take away the the ability of either state or federal governments to impose certain types of law from above claiming like sovereign sheriffs uh and and sheriff's races are a lot easier to win and sheriffs are law and order candidates as the head of like be like local law enforcement often the people that run the jails often the people that coordinate with immigration police on a a local level so i think that they're they're maybe trying to lay the groundwork for something that could happen in the future. They failed to impose the thing for this year, but it's still too soon to say that that it, they won't try for something. The military is pretty divided. I think there's a lot of soldiers that maybe agree with Trump, but the officers, for the most part, tend to think he's a buffoon and don't want to send troops into deadly combat if they can avoid it, nor unleash troops into the U S and that was kind of seen during the protests this summer. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think what is also important in U S that you have a way bigger networks that are organized. And I think you have way bigger chances of surviving this than we do even right now. In terms of the uh, mutual aid and like solidarity stuff. Yeah. And even like, I mean, politically, politically speaking, you have the liberal movement, you have the anti-fascist movement, you have the bizarre socialist movement or some democratic, whatever leftist you call it. Like all of it is present. And to 
build up a dictatorship, you really need those groups, the political groups, to be in the weakest position before, like they ever been. And I think, I think, like the four years of Trump actually created the platform where it would be really hard for Trump himself to build up the dictatorship because he united so many forces and he pushed in your direction, in the anarchist direction, in the anti-fascist direction, a lot of liberals who do not have this perspective anymore of kumbaya and everybody's happy, as I understand. Well, there were also more people that voted in this election for Trump than voted during the last election for Trump. So hmm. we kind of assumed that he would be, that a lot of people from coming from a socially conservative Christian perspective in a lot of cases would be turned off by his crudeness um, over the years and and his like blatant politicking uh, who would vote against him and even though more people voted in this election than any other US election in history still there were more people like still still more people voted for him than in the prior election even though more people voted against him you know what I mean like it still shows that there's a, a very strong movement of people that believe that him in charge of the Republican Party is better than having any sort of other party in charge, which is kind mm -hmm. of frightening. Yeah, it can go quite messy. I really appreciate this conversation. And um, is there anywhere that people can follow your further thoughts? Do you do you blog or anything or on social media? Or should people just pay attention to the ABC Belarus site for more news on um, on things as they develop in Belarus? I, I think nobody should blog and Twitter and participate in Facebook. I do that, but you shouldn't listen to me. You should actually go and um, watch the news on ABC Belarus. Um, there is also a website from the anarchist media collective that's called Pramen, which is P-R-A-M-E-N dot E-O. Um, so there are groups that are doing a little bit of a coverage in English as well. And we're trying to translate um, as much as possible that the people do not start believing that Belarusian uprising is a fucking fascist coup. So follow those, check out the news, spread the news. If you are on Twitter and Facebook, spread the news. I mean, you can blog about your cat or you can blog about the fucking revolution. Or both. Or both. I, I, I don't know. I depends. Some cats are not really nice. I'm more <laughs> a dog person. Um, right. So follow up and yeah, hopefully... We will win. I mean, we are still looking into the bright future where Lukashenko is going to shave his mustache and his f***ing hair and will go to prison. Or maybe he will have a dacha in Moscow. We don't give a f***, but we hopefully get rid of the old fart and live a little bit more free life. Not an anarchist republic yet or confederation, but on one step closer. Thank you so much for having this chat. Thank you for organizing all of this. Bye bye. In case you appreciate the work that we do here at The Final Straw, I'd like to share a few ways you can show it. First up, tell folks about the show, share it on social media if you're on there, rate us on iTunes, all that stuff. If you live in an area with a community or college radio station and you'd, and you'd like to hear these conversations up on the air, breaking out of the bubble of the online environment, consider contacting the station, telling them that you are a listener and that you want them to air us. We provide a weekly radio show for free, easily available for broadcast on FCC airwaves, and if those stations pick up Pacifica content, it's even easier to get us. You can visit the tab on our website for more details, and reach out to us if you want help. If you want to support us monetarily, we appreciate it, and you can make a one-time donation via PayPal or Venmo, or recurring donations via PayPal or LibraPay. You can also subscribe to us via Patreon for monthly payments and receive thank you gifts. You can also buy some of those gifts, since it is the season where people shop to show their love, such as t-shirts, sticker packs, and the like uh, via our big cartel store. And those links are and more are up on our website. You can find it by clicking the donate slash merch link. Finally, a great way to support us is to get in touch, give us feedback, or send us show suggestions. Thank you so much. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. 
If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.